All right, it looks like it's about five after, so we'll get started. Thank you everyone for coming to spend your Tuesday evening discussing socialism and electoral politics. My name is Griffin. I'm a DSA member in Virginia. And like many members of DSA, I became a socialist in large part by following and supporting the campaigns of Bernie Sanders. And I even two years ago in 2019 had the honor of voting for a Democratic Socialist DSA endorsed candidate for city council, Michael Payne, who went on to win his seat and is a great tribune of socialism. Tonight's uh, event, which is co-hosted by the National Political Education Committee, which puts on educational calls for DSA's membership like this, and the National Electoral Committee, which coordinates DSA's electoral work across the country, uh, will be about socialism and electoral politics. It's right on the can. And the agenda will go like this. We'll hear from three speakers, two of them electoral leaders in the organization from chapters where DSA has had a lot of electoral success. And our third speaker will be a candidate, uh, DSA endorsed candidate for city council in Florida. There will be a period for questions at the end. And if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A box. You can find that by going to the bottom of your screen, clicking on Q&A, it looks like two speech bubbles, and typing in your question there. And we'll be able to ask it at the end of our speakers. Uh, but without further ado, I'll introduce our speakers. The first is a member of DSA's National Electoral Committee, Fanon Laka. The second is Robin Peterson, co-chair of Chicago DSA. And the third is Richie Floyd, DSA endorsed city council candidate. I'll turn it over now to Finan. Hi everyone, so cool to be here. So I'm now gonna scramble to look for where my doc is. I had it up, but then I accidentally clicked it closed. Oh, hey, there it is, awesome. Well, so glad to be with you today. Um, yeah, so I am just going to tell you some things about our electoral work and strategy. Um, like Griffin said, you know, I'm, I'm involved in the National Electoral Committee as well as being involved in our chapter and having some experience myself running the campaign. Um, uh, but I think there's like a, a bigger story we can tell about elections that I, I think will be useful for all of us to think through. And though it's a little bit concrete, I think can also sort of eliminate the bigger, like big picture socialist strategy questions. So fundamentally, I think elections are basically the best and most effective way right now for us to grow our organization in terms of numbers, reach, profile, and political sophistication. In some ways, I think that's really obvious. Our organization wouldn't be possible without Bernie and the clear need many Americans feel to have an alternative to the political establishment and neoliberalism. Millions of voters came out for Bernie in 2016 and the entire political terrain shifted because it took place on the largest platform in the country. But since then, with major congressional runs as well as several bids for local office, we've seen that not only does elective office boost the profile of the left where the media focuses, like in Congress or in presidential campaigns, but it also has the ability to more directly shift your social terrain in part by winning an elected office, but also by creating an organization and you know, being able to publicize and make real left-wing political ideas, uh, you know, a program. But what is a political campaign, you know, and why, and why does it accomplish that goal? Um, in essence, a political campaign is a massive concentration of resources used to reach people to get them to take a concrete action, that is to vote. Broadly speaking, you can reach people in two ways. Through visibility, that's like a literal sign on a door, an advertisement, you know, something you see and which registers the presence of a campaign. And the other way is through direct connections with voters. And once the election is over, um, you know, it's over. A political campaign's done, win or lose, pretty clear, we wrapped up. Um, most campaigns today for office especially below the congressional level, rely purely on visibility and networks of relationships. With low voter turnout, low information around local elections and, and varying degrees of corporate cash, money gets spent 
to get your name and face out there in an ordinary campaign. Ultimately, folks that do go to the polls, you know, I think tend to end up voting for who's most familiar, you know, there's party identification and general elections uh, also happening. But what's worse, you know, they, they, you know, in the primaries, they can often, you know, barely have a choice at all, or really just not have a choice, um, as is the case with so many incumbents who run unchallenged every year for offices around the country. So for the majority of people in politics, you know, who like are in the campaign world, you know, they'll say like a bad campaign is a campaign with either no money or more rarely, no one very good at spending it. Um, although the latter is pretty common, the, you know, the idea that, I could, that you could spend money badly for, you know, your typical campaign politico is maybe not so, so clear and accessible. And then for them, like the, the good campaign is one that has lots of money, and even if no one can spend, uh, spend it very well, they have enough money to win anyway. Uh, I think you can imagine really clearly what kind of effect this has on our political system. Now, there are also other campaigns, um, which are campaigns that do focus on outreach, focus on those kinds of one-to-one -one conversations and, and can build a lot of energy out of them. One of the most legendary campaigns to do this in recent history was actually Obama 08, um, where uh, some people who are key DSA leaders now, including my, my friend um, and, and now boss, uh, Tasha Van Aken, who sort of brought field to NYC DSA's electoral project, first learned how to do it. Um, so what's the model there? Basically, you define who you want to talk to, you create materials like literature and scripts to talk to them with, and you get a way to track the conversations you have so you can follow up. But in order to do that at a big scale, you need a ton of people to step up, people who can manage the data, people who can assign people locations, people who can run the trainings ahead of the canvases, people who can input the data, and so on. To run a large scale operation of talking to people, you need tons of volunteers and the infrastructure of volunteer leaders to support it. Now, you know, in many, you know, good campaigns, all these skills, you know, get learned and developed and then because a campaign just ends, people go on their merry way. Those who learn something might maybe end up going on to work for other campaigns. Others might join consultancies. Most of them probably just drop off. So there's this big issue where, you know, uh, what, even when skills do get learned, they end up being held by a very tiny experienced elite. Again, another way in which like the ability to run campaigns, you know, ends up being held by people who you end up having to pay or, you know, who are specialists, um, you know, in some way connected to or associated with the political establishment, since they're the one with resources. Um, you know, and I, I think that's connected to another big issue in, in, in that even in good campaigns, staff sometimes can come off as elites coming in from on high who know what to do. They act like they're so smart, so savvy, well-connected, um, and it's not a culture that, you know, maximizes potential, brings out the most of people, or really feels like for a lot of volunteers that like they're in a position to like really shape, you know, what's happening. So that's like big picture, like what elections look like, what the terrain's like, but what does all this mean for the left? Well, for the parts of the left that supported running in elections and on the Democratic Party ballot line, uh, you know, it, it often meant supporting whoever was the most left. This is like what DSA's sort of attitude was prior to, you know, our explosion and growth in, in 2015, 2016. Um, so it often meant that, you know, um, it meant supporting whoever was most left. Maybe their campaign was good, maybe it wasn't, but that was kind of that. If you won, that was great, but the apparatus around the campaign was demobilized. It didn't leave with very much organization. Um, on the other hand, the part of the left that I came from, uh, we just didn't really participate in elections. And when we did, it was endorsing and then occasionally maybe showing up to Canvas once or twice for a quixotic Green Party run for governor or something. I don't know if any of you are here are New Yorkers, but you know, shout out to my Hawkins 2014 people. <laughs> um, so now you know a lot about how elections work and about how the left uh, you know, and how the left has been disconnected from it. So uh, what does a socialist strategy look like that can actually be effective at moving left electoral power um, and creating something different politically? Um, 
I think we can sort of think about it by like asking ourselves if we can fix the problems. So let's say instead of a campaign just disappearing afterwards, everyone was part of the same organization and could build on lessons cycle to cycle. Let's also say that instead of the campaign and staff running everything, volunteers are empowered to lead with skills and strategy coming from the organization with staff there to support volunteer leadership. Let's say that instead of someone just being the more progressive candidate in the local race, an organization is there to pick someone who is a socialist and is committed to a program and an organization that gets decided on democratically, um, you know, where the endorsement gets decided on democratically. And let's say that instead of corporate dollars, you take a vow, no real estate money, no corporate money, and instead build a mass fundraising base locally and nationally. It seems to me, I would wager, my experience in New York has been, that you can really transform electoral politics by doing those things. And you can really pose a clear socialist political alternative, programmatic, point by point, public ownership, and you know, and you know, defending workers' rights, promoting organization, saving our environment, giving people health care, a real alternative program. Um, that's something that we, we can make real in, you know, especially in, I think in state politics, which I'll come back to at the end. Um, and when you're doing that, when you're electing people and you're posing that clear political alternative and you've built up this organization and volunteer base instead of leaders, I think at that point, you're really acting like something like a political party. Um, and that's really powerful. So, you know, I think all of this kind of approach has really led to the su success of our, um, we've had in our electoral work in New York and especially with our model of electoral working groups, which I think are really worth talking about. You know, we didn't start like from day one being like, okay, now we're going to go pick one of our members and we're going to go run. What we did do was we made sure our, endo our endorsements were of people who we felt were socialists and where, where we were using our organization as the basis to do it, where we'd be able to take away the lessons, take away the data, um, and make sure that even if we weren't running the campaign with DSA's field operation, which we sort of tried to do a little on our own, um, you know, that we did talk about our program and did talk about socialist politics. And I think as our skills grew, we got to the point where we could really truly run our campaigns and win. It took maybe some cycles of losses, but we got there because we were building an organization where people were learning and then, you know, sharing that experience with others, training others on how to do it. And because that's a model that's fundamentally, you know, about like, look, there's this timeline, we have to scale ourselves up and therefore we have to share knowledge across people and then we come away and keep it in the organization between cycles. I think it's a model we can replicate across the country and that we can use to make DSA, you know, a real national political force. Today, many state and local governments have had no accountability for decades, but we can change that and offer a working class program and elect people who have moral authority, who work together and who work with an organization to pass transformative reforms. Um, in New York, the strategy has paid off legislatively as we passed the 2019 rent laws um, that completely overhauled our rent system uh, to protect, you know, we have this thing called rent stabilization, protects you against evictions, limits the amount your landlord can increase your rent. Um, so, you know, are the 2019 laws really saved it from being, you know, slowly chipped away and, and protected a massive amount of affordable housing stock? And it's again what we did this year when we, you know, with a slate of uh, six socialists in office, organized the Tax the Rich campaign that ultimately generated $4.3 billion in new revenue on the rich for the state, um, part of the, the first non austerity agenda in New York State in, in a long, long time. Um, there's so much more we can do. We can, you know, we can win healthcare for all, free college, publicly owned energy uh, production and distribution and evictions, especially at the state level where there's, you know, people don't necessarily know that much and there's a whole lot of power. Um, we can campaign on these issues and we can build campaigns to win them uh, when we elect people. So that's what I have to say about elections. They're great. We can do more of them. In doing more of them, we can grow our organization and do so much. Um, in discussion, I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about what we've done with the elections we've won in New York, since I think that's also fascinating and, and pretty exciting. And the last thing I'll say is like, this is basically my, my take on what the national electoral strategy is, but I recommend all of you read it yourselves because it's a very thoughtful document that really you know, paints a picture of, of the kind of thing we can do. So um, I'll see if I can get a link out down in the chat. Thank you guys. Looking forward to discussion.
Thank you so much, Fainan. Uh, and now we'll hear from Robin Peterson from Chicago. Hey, can you hear me? Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Robin Peterson. I'm the co-chair of Chicago DSA, and I also worked on the campaign of one of our six socialist alder people, Jeanette Taylor, as her field director in 2019. Um, I was actually tasked with talking about the NEC electoral strategy, and I'm also going to encourage everyone to read it. It's only two pages. It's pithy, and it's really good. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk about um, it, it talk about it in the context of Chicago. Um, and before getting started, I wanted to say that I'm glad we're having this discussion right now, uh, because I think in some ways we are still reeling from Bernie's loss in 2020 uh, and trying to get our bearings after that. Maybe not everybody feels that way in different chapters, but I feel that way here very much. and. I think between the disappointment of Bernie's loss, the immiseration of the pandemic, um, and also seeing a different kind of political uprising and political moment with the George Floyd uprising, and um, in some cases, like taking different lessons from that, I think that we have perhaps lost a bit of the consensus and some of the unity that our organization had because of the Bernie campaign. and. Um, I'm not sure to what extent that will continue to be true, but I feel like we're in this moment of kind of revisiting these things. And I think that's good. And I think um, so these questions of what kind of organization we are, what we do, what electoral work is for need to be talked about right now. And I'm glad we're doing that. Uh, so what I want to talk about is what is so important about DSA's electoral work and also what are some of the challenges that we face with it. Uh, so why has DSA been so successful with electoral politics? Uh, Fanon talked about why it's been so successful for us growing as an organization, um, but we had these other socialist organizations that um, in previous decades weren't winning the way we are. Um, and weren't serious contenders in these elections. Uh, so why are we why are we having so much success? Um, so from the Chicago perspective, this has been an interesting place to see this happen because our city is so associated with the Chicago with the Democratic Party political machine. And this is the city where a ward committeeman famously said, to a volunteer who showed up to volunteer for a candidate, we don't want nobody that nobody sent. And I think that it turned out in 2019 in Chicago that Chicago DSA was the nobody that nobody sent. Uh, we, we found out two things at the same time. One, uh, you can win an election by knocking doors and making phone calls. And you can do that with volunteers. And at the same time, um, we knocked and we found out the machine was hollowed out and we could just walk through it. Not that it was easy, <laughs> it was still really hard, but we won six seats, six socialists were elected. Nobody expected to win that much. And I think um, there were many similar things in in New York uh, around um, defeating Joe Crowley, AOC. So we've, um, yeah, we discovered that the structure was rotten. Um, and we also found out like, okay, you can take 50 people, you can take 15 people and you can start running a volunteer canvas, um, whether it's for a candidate or a ballot referendum, like we started with here around rent control in Chicago. And that's a way um, you get together, you decide to do that, you can actually start to win some political power. And you can do that as an independent, member dues funded democratic socialist organization. And that is the genius of DSA. Nobody sent us, but we're winning. Nobody paid us, but we're winning elections. So I just wanna pause on that. like. That's so different from what has been on the political scene for a long time. It's new and it's different. 
um, especially at our scale. Uh, and but the result of this is that um, some people really don't want us. And some people want us around, but they want to call the shots and they don't want us to remain an independent organization. And it doesn't take long at all to start getting both of these kinds of attention as an organization, as a chapter anywhere. Um, so to continue on with the challenges of electoral politics, the first is that as soon as you start putting these thousands of boots on the ground, volunteer hours out there into elections, uh, you are going to start encountering pressures internally and externally from folks who want you to put those hours into one thing or another. Um, as soon as you start winning elections and putting socialists in office, then you also encounter the challenges of, are you able to actually support them in winning what they ran on? Um, and also, is your organization able to exercise discipline of those those electeds that you put in office, or are they um, able to discipline the organization instead? Um, I'll say that elected officials exercise a lot of authority as actual leaders, um, but once they go into that institution that is like a really powerful institution and DSA is very small fry compared to Chicago City Council, they get paid a salary, they have an office, they have staff, and they exercise a gravity that is really hard for an organization like DSA to resist. Um, and for all our size and our electoral sophistication, we are still quite fragile, we don't have great institutional memory, and we're still, we still have a relatively low level of political development among our members, in my opinion. Um, so this can, this is a real challenge for us. Uh, and then another, the final thing I'll mention, um, when you show up as an independent socialist organization that nobody sent for, um, is something we saw, we're seeing primarily on the national stage, which is um, that the Democratic Party becomes united against socialism in the left. And so does the right. And there's this backlash from both the Democratic Party and the right, uh, with the, the rhetoric about the radical left, all that paranoid rhetoric. Um, and this is something we haven't seen too much on the local level in Chicago, but one can imagine how this could become a real threat. So I um, want to mention that too. Uh, all right, so we, we had Bernie's loss, we had the events of the past year, and these have opened up again the question of what kind of organization DSA should be. Um, but despite all that, I think um, electoral work is going to continue to be central to the work our organization does because it's energizing, it's clarifying, it's how people think about politics, and it is something we can actually win, which is very important. And um, engaging in this work and confronting the challenges it poses is going to be how we grow our organization and develop our politics. And if we want to win reforms that improve the lives of working class people, which we need now uh, more desperately than ever after the last year, uh, we must continue to run in and win elections. So I hope to see us doing more of this work. Me too. Thank you so much, Robin. Now we'll go to Richie Floyd who is a DSA endorsed city council candidate in St. Petersburg, Florida. Hey, I'm uh, really happy to be here and share a little bit about, uh, you know, what organizing uh, not just for uh, the campaign has been like, but through the campaign has been like for our DSA chapter. So uh, my name's Richie and I'm from St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, my DSA chapter is Pinellas County, Florida, which is you know a county-based chapter uh, in St. Petersburg is the biggest city, but there's also Clearwater, Florida, uh, Dunedin, Largo, uh, a lot of coastal cities. Um, we're very close to Tampa. We're in the Tampa Bay area. Um, 
in Central Florida, uh, West Central Florida. So that's where I'm located. And Pinellas County uh, DSA chapter is not a huge DSA chapter. We have a few hundred members. Um, we have a high level of activity. A high proportion of our members are active in the chapter, um, but we're not a big place. We're not New York, we're not Chicago, um, but we're seeing results from uh, just running an electoral campaign here. And, you know, this is my first time running an election. This is our first time as a chapter running a candidate. Uh, I was DSA uh, co-chair before. Um, I was, you know, on the steering committee for a couple of years before I did this. And so uh, really the campaign is rooted in DSA. So uh, the campaign's run by mostly people in the chapter, um, uh, pretty much exclusively people in the chapter, and not just in our chapter, but in Tampa and Orlando DSA as well. Um, we're just about 90 uh, minutes away from Orlando and, and a half an hour away from Tampa. Uh, people come here often to help. And so one of the things that's been powerful is we've been able to have cross chapter conversations about things. Um, you know, it's one of the positive things, I guess, if you want to see anything positive out of the pandemic is that Zoom has made it accessible for everyone and we're all used to using it now. And so uh, we're really organizing together. But because the campaign is, uh, you know, DSA run, just like uh, has been talked about already, is we're gaining institutional knowledge for our organization. Um, we're learning how to do things uh, that then we're going to be able to use, not just on this campaign or on the next campaign, but for years and years as time goes on. And so we're in a very interesting place right now where we're starting to gain these kind of skills as volunteers, as leaders within our organization um, that we're going to be able to use for a long time. And so we're only going to get more effective from here uh, as long as we keep at it. So uh, like I said, it's DSA run. Um, that means you know, every volunteer that shows up to an event uh, gets trained by another DSA member, which makes it very, uh, which makes it very good, uh, which makes the campaign a very good place for recruitment for DSA as well. Um, you come in and you know you hear about an electoral campaign through the visibility that happens, and uh, and so you decide to show up to an event or there's an event in the park uh, that you live right by and you check it out and you know you hear things that you like. Uh, to see happen in your city and so uh, you get involved and then everybody that trains you is a DSA member and everyone's like hey you should join DSA it's really beneficial and because it's a big thing of visibility for people um, you do attract more people it's been a way for us to diversify our chapter a way for our chapter to get younger I don't know if anybody here knows about St. Petersburg Florida but it's traditionally been like a retirement community uh, it's changed a lot in the past 10 years uh, it's gotten a lot younger but uh, our chapter did start out uh, with just a lot of older people. And we've grown a lot younger through the campaign. We've grown a lot more diverse through the campaign. Uh, and that's just because we've been getting our message out there. And so we've been going door to door like's been talked about. Um, and it's been really beneficial uh, to you know, know exactly what's on the minds of uh, the people in, in our community and in our city. Uh, and you know, get them organized. When we're out going door to door, it's not just gaining support for the campaign, but it's list building of supporters uh, that we're gonna use time and time again to go back to talk to people. And so uh, you get a real connection to people in the community when you're doing that, uh, not just for this one election, but over time. And those are people who are gonna be your base for each campaign you launch, not just an electoral campaign to get someone elected, but an issue-based campaign. If you're gonna have a campaign like Tax the Rich or a campaign for public power, you can go back to people that you know agree with you because you've already been able to connect with them and you can build a deeper relationship with those people. And those people uh, have networks inside of your area. Um, they're connected to their family and their friends and you really can start to grow like that. Even if you're not growing membership, you're growing supporters. And so uh, it's really important uh, that we go out and we do the work of talking to people and we get a lot out of it. Um, traditionally campaigns uh, across Florida, I would say across the entire state have been visibility efforts. And I'm talking from the top on down, even the presidential races here have been visibility efforts. Florida is an interesting situation because we have so many transplants. I'm a native Floridian, um, but that's pretty rare. And to tell you the truth, I moved to the city that I'm in right now um, as an adult after college. And so, um, you know, there's internal uh, movement in Florida and there's a lot of uh, people moving to Florida. A lot of them are immigrants. A lot of them are from New York and the Midwest. 
so what I'm getting at is we don't really have civic institutions like they do in other places. People aren't connected to each other the way uh, that someone's been in a place for generations and generations are. So uh, it makes it even more important that we go directly to where the people are, their homes, their workplaces, um, the public spaces that they spend their time in and we actually have con uh, conversations with them and so uh people haven't done that in the past and po this is a whole new kind of politics for our city and our state because for so long people have just spent time doing the visibility thing because it's that it's just easier honestly it's easier to just get your name out there and it's a lot of work and i'm i'm tired right now i was canvassing before this call i was at a neighborhood event before this call um but it's very rewarding and if we really want to change things we have to be rooted in the community if we want to change things we're going to have to be rooted in people's workplaces and in people's uh lives and so um it's really important. So anyway, I want to tell you a little bit more about some of the things that we've been able to do for our DSA chapter and for our movement through the campaign. Um, one of the things is, is we've been able to build, like I mentioned before, cross chapter collaboration and bigger uh, relationships with people. And uh, that includes not just with other chapters, but with national DSA as well. So we're all members of a chapter or at large members. Um, and, you know, DSA national sometimes can be like a sort of like a, um, a nebulous thing that we think about, like, oh, what is DSA national? Um, well, first, it's just us in a democratic fashion electing leaders. But second, uh, it's a group. Uh, it's an organization that we're all a part of that has resources that we can lean on. And uh, it can be sometimes hard for people who, you know, are outside of a major hub like I am to know exactly how to interface with those resources. But for uh, when you get involved uh, in a campaign and you start to have these conversations intentionally about the things that you need to get done uh, and you talk to people from across the country and who are national leaders, they have resources they can give you. There's uh, DSA access to uh, voter voter networks, a uh, van, if you know about that, um, uh, that your chapter can use. There's, you know, uh, spoke texting that your chapter can use through national. Um, there's a whole host of things. And uh, those are all tools that you'll be able to get and develop um, your skills on. And then you'll be able to use later on, not just in DSA things, but also, you know, this is what uh, professionals use and you're gaining professional experience through this. And so it's a, it's a really valuable thing to have in, in life in general, but it's also really valuable for our movement. And that's why it's most important. So uh, it's really great to uh, have a reason to actually be forced to go use those tools because you know when you don't understand things uh, it kind of is mystified and you you maybe avoid it you run your local campaign the way that you have always done um, but you know having a direct end goal and a direct result that you need forces you to you know make strong decisions make changes and and that's a great way to do it um, and connecting to national is a great uh, great thing to lean on. Um, and additionally, we're doing a couple more things uh, with uh, the campaign that's helping us grow, you know, not electorally, not just rooted in the communities, but rooted in, uh, you know, I think what I think personally is the most important place for us to be rooted in, which is the workplace. And so uh, we're using our campaign to connect with labor organizations. Um, the, uh, the labor movement is, you know, heavily focused on elections because, you know, the people in charge of the government often uh, are um, making the rules about how the uh, workplace operates, making the rules about how labor unions can operate. They're often bosses because the workers at cities and states are, are union members. And so um, the labor movement's really interested in this. Uh, and you know, one of the biggest things we're doing is connecting to the labor movement. And we're doing that through uh, a couple of ways. First is you know, obviously just presenting a positive vision about what uh, we can change for working people in our city here. Um, and, you know, trying to speak to the labor movement and their wants and needs uh, and, you know, connecting with the people who are engaged there. Um, but then we're also trying to connect to workers in their workplaces by, uh, for example, I'm a, a public school teacher and we have a, a little rank and file movement and um, we make sure like there's like a, we have teachers uh, who are organizing on my campaign who then go and talk to other teachers in their workplace about the campaign and a or teachers at the union all about the campaign. And so, uh, you know, we try to gain a little bit of grassroots energy. And I think the biggest thing, uh, and the I guess the lowest hanging fruit that we see with the labor movement is 
showing them like a different kind of politics is possible. Look, the people in the labor movement are jaded, just like a lot of the people at the doors. They don't realize that anything different is possible. They don't realize that there's a way you can organize that's rooted in the community, that's not funded by special interests, not funded by corporate PACs and developer money uh, that can actually win. And when you show them that that is possible, you know, their eyes start to open up. And so, you know, it's a little bit of work but the people in the labor movement want to see positive change for working people, uh, just like the rest of us do. And so when we show them, you know, hey, a better way is possible and here's how we're gonna do it, they oftentimes will get on board, you know? I mean, I know sometimes it's a bumpy road to that. I know, uh, uh, you know, different campaigns have had issues with it and stuff, but uh, for the most part, we're generally aligned in the same direction and they will see, you know, something new is possible, so they'll join in. Um, so uh, the labor movement's a big thing that we're trying to work with in the campaign. Uh, and I'm just gonna give you all one last thing uh, that we've been able to accomplish through the campaign organizing wise, um, that's been you know kind of enlightening for me, but because we've been doing recruitment and because during the campaign and because politics you know, is the way that people, or electoral politics is the way that people interact with a campaign uh, or at least interact with you know, politics in general, um, and the way that they know that politics in general works, you do attract people. Uh, we've attracted a lot of young people, actually, high school students, college students, and we've been able to use them, uh, tell them, you know, about what we are, DSA, here's what we stand for. Uh, they like it because uh, they're obviously attracted to the campaign, so they like what we stand for. Um, and we've been able to use them as, uh, or train them to be organizers, and they're starting to organize on their campus now to make YDSA chapters. And so we have a small university here. And uh, we got a, uh, um, a student from the university came to a campaign event. And now she's a very active member in our DSA chapter. And she's starting a, a YDSA at her university. Uh, we even had a, a couple of high schoolers um, that we met. Um, and now they're trying to start YDSA on their high school campus. And so uh, it's been a tool, you know, just to spread the message and it's been really exciting. The YDSA thing I'm really excited about. It's been difficult during COVID, uh, but it's hopefully going to get better soon. Um, and so that was a little surprise thing that we came, had come up in the campaign, but we're utilizing it as best as we can. Um, and, you know, just to end, I'd say uh, electoral campaigns are a thing that can unite a lot of people um, like Bernie United a lot of DSA, a lot of us are members because of Bernie. I know I'm a DSA member because of Bernie's run in 2016. Um, and uh, there are really things, you know, with that can inspire people to uh, get involved with their chapter and stay involved with their chapter and unite all people in the chapter. Uh, you know, no matter what differences we have, we're a Big Ten organization, but I think for the most part, we like to get socialists elected. So, um, it's a really uniting thing. It can help uh, smooth over any other issues you have. But uh, yeah, that's how we're using this campaign to organize uh, our community and our chapter and uh, the local labor movement. And it's been going well so far. Uh, I will say just a, a little bit about the status of the campaign. You know, we have uh, our mail-in ballots go out uh, in just about a month for the primary election. And we have to, we're going to have a competitive general as well. So it's going to be uh, a lot of work, uh, but it's very rewarding. And um, I really believe that when you go to people's house and you tell them like, hey, I'm here to fight for working people. We're here to fight for working people. This is about a movement, um, not just getting one person elected, um, that people respond positively to the message of like, we want to help working people like and unapologetically, like non-equivocating. We don't have donors that are twisting our arm the other direction. Um, I think people respond really well, and that's what we've seen so far. And I think, um, you know, people like to say socialism can't win in Florida, but I'm hoping we can prove them wrong. And I think uh, if we can, we can prove them wrong pretty much anywhere. Thank you so much, Richie. I'll say personally, I love to get socialists elected to office. And if you do too, you should consider donating to Richie's campaign. I think a link was shared in the chat and we're doing a big push for fundraising today. I had some questions, but they happened to overlap with a lot of the questions that were asked in the audience. So I think I'll just uh, go right into them. Uh, this, this one's immediately for Richie, I guess. Uh, have there been successful socialist campaigns in Florida before? Someone wants to know. Can you hear me? My computer froze. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, have there been. Okay, so 
uh, yeah, I do have a little bit of information for you on that front. Um, first, uh, I would not be the first socialist elected in my county um, because about a hundred years ago, the Socialist Party elected a state legislator uh, to in Pinellas County, Florida. Um, additionally, the mayor of Gulfport, Florida, which is a town literally about five minutes away from my house, um, was a Socialist Party member. Actually, the Socialist Party has a story to pass in Florida. Uh, Florida is a place full of working people who have been treated like crap by the billionaires. I think we're like literally the third most unequal state in the country. Um, so it's not a surprise that this has been in the past. In recent history, uh, there have been a couple of people who are elect got elected um, in the last couple of years, I think to city commissions in smaller cities who were endorsed by a local DSA chapter. Um, I can't say like they're socialists. I don't know if they're members or whatnot. Um, and uh but no one who's been endorsed by national um i did just hear also of a soil and water commission uh election that uh a dsa member did win like four years ago in orlando and they were just like a paper member before the chapter was even there and they got elected to soil and water commission and so we've been linking up a little bit lately to try to talk about you know uh what he's been up to because it's really interesting but like so far uh, the answer is like, you know, kind of, but not really. Like, I'm really hoping that we can show like an openly democratic socialist campaign uh, can win in, uh, you know, this is the fifth biggest city in the state um, and we're gonna have to win a lot of votes. And I think it'll uh, it'll prove a little bit, yeah. Carrying on a proud tradition in the Sunshine State. I think if there's one thing I took away from everyone's uh, contributions, it was that, uh, you can use electoral campaigns in order to build independent organization, DSA. Uh, and as was referenced by Robin and Fanon, um, in the past, or you know, like the last half century, socialism has not been a very prominent uh, force at the uh, national level in terms of electoral politics. And so I wonder if anyone wants to talk a bit why about why maybe. Uh, the importance of electoral politics was downplayed by socialists in the past, maybe, and um, the importance of, I guess, this sort of tactical innovation of running on the Democratic Party ballot line, since the Democratic Party is not really a party like parties in other countries. Yeah, I mean, I can speak from the like uh, very left perspective, you know, so I was a member of the International Socialist Organization, which was a kind of Trotskyist organization, a revol small revolutionary socialist group with, you know, maybe six, seven, eight hundred members. Um, and, you know, uh, the ISO's perspective at the time was something like, look, you know, we know that the Democratic Party is a party dominated by the bourgeoisie, by, by the capitalists. Um, and so, you know, electoral politics is not going to happen so much. We have seen reforms happen, but they usually happen when there's a big social movement. So our basic orientation was, why spend time, time trying to do elections when we know that when it's the, the U.S. electoral system is really hard and, you know, the two big parties are parties of capital and we can organize social movements to, to change things and ultimately, you know, transform this government by overthrowing it or having a mass workers revolution or something. So, you know, in that sense, we, we were essentially abstentionist. You know, we like, you know, we like I said, we'd endorse a campaign once in a while, but it wasn't like a real electoral strategy. I think, um, you know, another thing, I, I was listening recently to Bernie Sanders address DSA in, I think it was the eighties. He was like addressing some like Maryland DSA chapter or something. And he was like, look, you just got to try. And, and, I, and I feel like it was, you know, it was this funny thing where it's like DSA strategy at the time was literally to like, you know, be a part of the party, endorse people who are really good, try to get people to join. It was like this very soft, persuasive kind of model. And Bernie's like, no, 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 like just run a campaign and it has a program that's left to win and find the race that you can do that. And like a lot of, I think, pre, 
going to the house, you know, like, or like, right, you know, you read this in Outsider in the House, Bernie's book after he, he was elected to the House of Representatives, like he was like, you know, like, look, like the thing we did was like, we went and found the election that we could win and we won it. And that I think was like a, even though like that was a, for Bernie, a third party strategy, I think the kernel of that is, is really, really important to take away that like, there are winnable races. You build a platform and build a movement by going there and doing that. You know, I will say, uh, you know, today, I think that even compared to when Bernie was winning his first elections, the, the two party system has entrenched itself, both because of the intense polarization our society has, in particular over cultural questions, uh, and also because, you know, the Republican Party is just an, an anti democratic minoritarian party. Um, but also because legally the two-party system has been institutionalized further through successive uh, through successive reforms, um, especially in the wake of, of major left presidential campaigns, McGovern, Jesse Jackson, uh, and then Bernie. Um, so you know, I think like I think today, you know, the the breakthrough was was <laughs> in some ways just really clear. Like Bernie just like went and looked at the race that he could like get a big platform on and and did it. Um, and then, you know, we, uh, it, it became clear that like, oh, democratic primaries are a place where we, where we can contend. And I think that represented like a great opportunity to synthesize the both like the just do it and the like, how do we overcome the terrible obstacles that are, that our two party system sets up. Thank you. I have a few questions now about conservative portrayals, of socialism and how to campaign as socialists in conservative areas. Someone's pointed out that the places where DSA has experienced the most wins are generally Democratic Party strongholds, and that in order to win the big transformative reforms we want, we'll also need to win in conservative areas. Other people point out that, another questioner pointed out that, um, you know, conservatives talk about socialism as if it's something we should fear. And someone else asked, how can we effectively communicate our message to voters in conservative areas? So I'm wondering if anyone has answers to those. I mean, I'll say just a little bit about the socialism boogeyman for conservatives is that um, in Florida, we have someone running for Senate against Marco Rubio this year. And they are a former police chief. And Marco Rubio says that she wants to defund the police and institute a socialist agenda. If conservatives want to keep saying that, like they're just going to continue to like muddy the waters and normalize the word socialism. Like uh, with them saying that like everything bad is socialism, uh, I think that's probably a good thing for socialism because I don't think they're very popular either. And so uh, my take on it has always been, um, you know, don't be shy about your values. If someone's like, well, you're a socialist, you say, yeah, so let's talk about what that means for you as a working person. And that's, and that's the way that I've always done it. And you overcome it by having a lot of conversations with a lot of voters. That's just what it is. And, uh, you know, if you do that and you're not shy about your values, it's, it's not going to be a problem. Um, I think, you know, the majority of people have to sell their labor for a living. And so the majority of people are going to be receptive to this agenda when they know what it means. Um, there's nothing we can do about the way that conservatives talk about us. Uh, they talk about everybody like that. Uh, it's just a boogeyman, you know, whatever. Um, it's gonna take time and effort, but uh, as long as we keep doing the kind of work that we've been talking about doing on this call, I think that we can easily overcome it. Um, but that's just my two cents. I'm sure other people have opinions about it as well. Anybody else like to answer that question? Um, I have a few thoughts. Um, well, <laughs> I'm from Ohio and most of my family's from Kansas and I'm from a super conservative uh, part of Ohio. And, um, but Kansas is like a big Bernie state. Uh, uh, and that's partly because it has two big colleges there. Um, and 
when I think about this question about like, how do we win over red states? Like that's really hard. Um, and there, there's some parallels with Chicago um, because I think we, DSA we've seen like does well in certain areas. And well, the St. Petersburg example is so interesting, Richie, because um, most of the chapters I'm familiar with, including Chicago, have the opposite problem of being too young and not multi-generational in terms of having older folks, like folks older than like mid thirties or 40. And so um, we, yeah, and obviously like building a more multiracial organization is uh, some a struggle. Um, and so how do we how do we win over different constituencies than like downwardly mobile millennials is a, a big question for us uh, that we haven't answered yet. Uh, but I think going back to still knocking doors gets the job done, like go talk to people lean on the um, leaders we built through electoral work, including the electeds themselves. Um, that's something that we, it's gonna take longer than winning one election, I think to, um, to convince those uh, folks and other constituencies to like be part of an organization like DSA or, or to like bring them into our movement. I'll add one more thing, and I uh, I don't have any kind of uh, connection to red states to claim for myself. I, I have lived in New York for eight years and grew up in the Seattle area, so nothing nothing but blue. Um, but we, um, you know, I think um, I was talking to NPC member Megan Swaboda last night. She's also from Ohio, um, and she had this idea that that she wanted to pitch to me that I thought was really interesting which was that you know, the NEC at some point should go out and talk to every campaign that's run in a red state or run in somewhere that's a kind of swingy area and seeing like what, you know, how did it go? Like what worked, what worked on the doors, what worked in the comms and the messaging. I think Robin and Richie are really right. Like a conversation about a program that's pro worker is something that most people will understand. And they may end up coming to having ideological objections to it, but fundamentally that idea that like, you know, this is something I can do to make my life better is, is, is a clear one. Um, and so, you know, I think that, you know, there, there are ways we have to figure out how to communicate it. I think that there's something really, there's a there there that, that we can figure out. And as we do it, we should take opportunities as much as we can to generalize. So I'm really looking forward to, you know, talking to Richie again, post uh, November to hearing like, what ended up, what did you feel like ended up working? What did you feel like ended up didn't, regardless of the outcome, there's a lot of lessons to take away. The other thing I think I'll say is that there's a bigger strategic question for the left that I think is really important. That, you know, we, um, you know, if we're going to be running Democratic Party ballot line campaigns, we have to fight to, you know, flip legislatures, especially if we're focusing on state legislatures the way that the national electoral strategy suggests that we do. Um, and you know, in New York, uh, when Julia Salazar was elected, it was also the moment where a group of Democrats who had been caucusing with the Republicans uh, or conferencing with them, I should say, um, you know, and, and essentially stopping a Democratic majority from existing in both houses um, were knocked out. So Julia came in on this tide and was like the left flank of this tide that um, was throwing out something similar to a Republican rule. And it gave incredible energy to the movement. And a, a massive backlogged agenda of progressive, not necessarily socialist legislation, like ended up getting passed that year and has been passed in every year since. And that kind of like breakthrough and energy, I think is really important. So another question, and I, I just have no ability to answer this, but another question that we have to think about is like, what's our strategy relating to people who wanna, you know, maybe elect, do a left populist thing and elect people to, to flip legislatures. And we also, and how can we situ situate running and winning campaigns for socialism within a project that's doing something like that. Thank you. A number of the questions are really practically focused, which I hope means that after this call, we're going to see a bunch of electoral campaigns pop up across the country. Uh, and so I'll ask one of them. 
So Arthur asks, as a co-chair of the electoral working group of Milwaukee DSA, who was just a co-lead of a DSA slate this last cycle, where we had about 100 unique volunteers, but lost all three of our elections, I'm wondering how DSA National can help us with campaign management next cycle. And I think someone else also asked about sort of what, you know, what sort of things we've learned about how to run good campaigns. Whoever wants it. Yeah, well, I'll just briefly say, I think the, the NEC's perspective is that really for the next year, we need to set up a strong mentorship program to be really clear about this. And, you know, there's just a ton of technical skills that, you know, like, you know, I like on the phone with someone who is, um, who's running, who's working as a campaign manager can convey, like, you know, I just having done this, having learned the skills, like I can just explain things that if I hadn't had someone to explain to me, I would like, Jabari Brisport would not be an office. It would, there would be a whole disaster. It would be very bad. You know, but we had that, that institutional context. So we have a big responsibility to convey it. And I think so fundamentally, I think like what our chapters need is to be able to be able to reach out to the, N the NEC and get mentorship and be like really clear. Here's how you cut, here's how you cut a list. Here's how you, you know, cut turf. Here's, here's what a good training looks like. Here's what a good script looks like. Um, here are some comms materials that we've used in other campaigns to get a feel for how you might want to communicate yourself. Um, I think, you know, I think that kind of stuff is like really, really valuable. I've been having some great conversations with Joel Brooks, who's running in New Jersey um, for city council. And I, you know, I, I, it's been really fun and exciting talking, you know, he's, he's still running his own campaign. The campaign's out, not out until November, but helping him, you know, helping him think through all the different pieces of, of what a campaign is and it, it's something we can do and I, I basically feel like the more we run elections the more the number of people who understand how to run an election will there will be and the more we can scale up our mentorship so I think the task for the NEC very unambiguously is to create a scalable mentorship program just the same way we create scalable field programs thank you I think I have a question that's well suited for Robin from Ethan, who's with Southern Maine DSA in Portland, Maine. They had tremendous success with their People First campaigns to pass four referenda last fall and a slate of candidates to their charter commission last week. But they've got a lot of growing pains with some progressives being angry that they've used negative messaging to contrast their candidates against more mainstream Dems. Do you have any advice or experience from the, the Chicago context of progressives not taking well, or establishment figures not taking well to the socialist message? Um, yeah, um, no, I'm trying to think of something that like really parallels that, but I think, um, sorry, where was that again? That's a smaller city, right? Uh, Portland, Maine. Portland, Maine. Um, yeah. I think here um, there, there's enough of uh, like a very much establishment democratic party machine. And then there's a movement that, um, you know, is very labor backed that is in opposition to that. And so fortunately, like we're a lot, we have all those allies. And so that's, who we end up talking to more. Um, I guess, you know, we did run into this when it came, not so much when it came to running people and that kind of messaging, but we censured one of our, um, our aldermen that we endorsed, um, Alderman Vasquez, and that was because of a vote he made on the budget. Um, and so at that time, there, there, and even maybe up to this day, there that caused a lot of like um, back and forth uh, and tension around like what does the movement do? What do these organizations do when our electeds vote, vote away? We don't want them to. And I think the stance we took was like um, a lot, uh, you know, more swift and hard than. Um, a lot of these other organizations would. And uh, so, 
Um, I think stick to your guns for the most part. That you, it usually means you're doing something right when you get that kind of stuff. I see Richie nodding. So yeah, I'll leave it there. Richie, I don't know if you have any practical experience you'd like to speak on or. Uh, no, I was just like, stick to your guns. I just, that's definitely the message that I would have, you know, if you're getting pushback from people who have done things a certain way for forever and it hasn't helped working people, uh, they'll they'll just have to get over it is, is pretty much what it is. Absolutely. I think we will do two more questions. Uh, so one of the questions we received uh, was I think one that DSA members think about a lot and it's kind of about how to you know, align our candidates and elected officials with our members in our organization. And when people talk about this, a lot of the times they use, uh, you know, they talk about mechanisms of accountability or how do we discipline our elected officials. But I think it's a question of, you know, how do we, you know, integrate our, our elected leaders, our public leaders with our organization. I'm wondering, you know, how, how do you all think about this? Do we just need to uh, you know, get more members and become stronger or elect more people, or is there a sort of institutional fix? I can talk a little bit about our work in New York. Um, so, you know, in New York, we've run and elected different kinds of folks. You know, I think uh, the first thing that, you know, I've, I've heard said, and if it's not a wrong answer, is the answer to this question is elect our member leaders you know, elect people who are active in DSA, who are like well-known by the chapter, who know, who you know are just gonna be loyal to DSA because they're, you know, ideologically committed to a strand of socialism that has that idea of discipline in it. And, and not all strands of socialism do, but you know, they, you know, that's, it's a common thing in DSA to feel that way. Um, and, you know, I, I feel that way. Um, but the, uh, but, you know, that's not always possible and it's not always desirable, like, you know, NYC DSA, we certainly do have working class people of color of our members. Uh, and we've worked really hard to grow to the point where that's happening a little bit more, but we're still predominantly downwardly mobile millennial organizations, a lot of white folks in, you know, in our organization, and we're running in a lot of districts that are predominantly people of color. Um, and at the same time, like we are partnered with organizations, we are, you know, we are ourselves doing organizing that develops folks who, um, you know, aren't like coming through and, and becoming like, you know, first and foremost, strong ideological socialists, but, you know, people like Ferris Sifrant Forrest, who, who, who is my boss, you know, she was organizing her, you know, she was, she had the problem in her building, some, some tenant organizers who are DSA members working for a different organization knocked her door, you know, she became a tenant leader organizing, you know, uh, organizing the fight to stop a redevelopment of her building you know, it was I knew, pretty successful. I think it's like really cool. And then from there, she got involved in the statewide, uh, uh, the statewide fight around the rent laws again. And so she has this political trajectory that's like very much with DSA organizers, but not like a here, like, let me give you a, a you know, a political, you know, theoretical background that's like totally there. She, she you know, she learns the stuff, she starts coming to DSA meetings, et cetera. But you know, it's not the first thing um, and it's not the place that her, her politics necessarily came from. Um, and so, you know, I think you have, a, so you have a range of people you're working with. And I, and I think this is a really, really good and great thing. And Farrah is an amazing organizer and it's part of what makes her a great elected is that she understands that on a deep level. She understands her community on a deep level. Um, but you have like a range of people. So, you can't just be like, okay, well, everyone's just gonna like know what to, uh, you know, it's just gonna be loyal to DSA. So there's a thing out there about like, we have to figure out like, how do we how do we create that sense that like, you know, what DSA thinks matters. There's another problem though, which is how does DSA, what DSA thinks even matter? Like, you know, who is to expect that all of us are supposed to understand how Albany the state capital of New York works? How are we supposed to understand how you move legislation? This is something we also, you know, have to figure out. And we have some folks who are, involved in, in that kind of work, but you know, not, not that many, a lot of us, a lot of us have had to learn. And so what we did was we were like, okay, let's try to think about not in terms of like discipline and accountability, but in terms of support. How can we, you know, help them staff up? How can we find the information that we think, you know, will like prepare them and put them in the best place? How can we, you know, get them in conversation with folks to talk about how major left legislation has been passed in the past? Um, 
And, and importantly, like, how can we do that in a way where like ESA members are going through the experience at the same time as the electives? Um, and I think that's just been like so important and vital. So what we have now is a socialist and office committee. It meets every week. We have uh, DSA members and all the electives on the calls and some of their staff. Um, and we work through things. And then we have like the constituent services staff meets together and policy people are meeting all together to talk about it. There's like a whole you know structure of like bringing NYC DSA and our electives together to operate in lockstep. And we've, I think, learned a lot being able to do that. I think the really the thing that we're trying to figure out now is like how do we make collective decisions and how do we like decide how we're going to vote these are like things that are high stakes and complicated and require a lot of trust and clarity but i also think like the more sophisticated we are i'm like what is our policy in the state how are we trying to use policy in order to move things what is our understanding of the politics and how much do we trust each other to be able to communicate what we all understand because legislatures they really operate to fragment you to mess you up to throw you off so there's this big effort that we have to undertake to organize something to make it better. Uh, long story short, it's an organizing problem. And, and I think we just have to set ourselves a task of figuring out how to do it. Robin, did you want to answer that? Um, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, a really tough challenge. Um, and also, um, I think that we sometimes just need to listen to the um, electeds and understand what their perspectives are, both what it's like to have a job in city council or Springfield or Albany, but also like what they hear from their constituents every day. Um, and also, sometimes we have to be like, we're just gonna make this decision even if you don't like it. And that's really hard to do. And, um, and I, I think that uh, we haven't really figured out how to make sure that we can still do the latter or we and the the for, like the first thing like we also haven't really quite set up like the lines of communication that we need to do the first thing so it's really challenging and um and, and that's another thing where we should all be like talking as chapters um i think that like cross chapter coordination could be a really good way to figure out how we navigate these things. Robin, we don't talk enough. <laughs> okay, so for our last question, uh, we have something directly for Richie. Uh, Matthew asks, what was your process in making the decision to run for office? As a school teacher, you might not have had a background in politics. So how did you find yourself making the decision to run? how did you get started? find campaign managers, organize, et cetera. So I think this is your opportunity to end the call by convincing every single attendee to themselves, take up the challenge to run for office. Okay, so I think I'll start with something. Uh, first off, that's a lot of pressure. But uh, second, uh, I think I'll start with something that, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders said uh, that makes it, makes the task a little less daunting. And he said, um, you know, he's trying to encourage people to run for office. And he was like, uh, I think what he said was, if you don't think like you're capable or smart enough to run for office or be in one of these positions, uh, well, I'm in the US Senate. Uh, yes, you are like basically implying that the people in the Senate like have no idea what they're doing, which is kind of obvious if you uh, pay any amount of attention. So. Um, you know, and that's been my experience in local politics too, is that, uh, you know, I think the default is kind of not really knowing what's going on, but um, so that's first. And so like, don't, it, it shouldn't be a confidence thing for anybody as far as like what it takes to do it, um, you know, and what sort of led me to do it is, I, I mean, I had experience on like issue-based campaigns, um, ballot referendums. It's something that we deal with every two years here in Florida, there's ballot referendums statewide and I've been organizing on them for a while. So I gained a little bit of experience. I would recommend, you know, if you're interested in like 
uh, running for office or, or being a part of a campaign to run for office is just get started like, you know, with a local election. I even volunteered for just generally progressive people, not much, but um, just a few times to see like what was what was what, you know, before there was a DSA chapter in my area and uh, learned a little bit that way. Um, and then, um, you know, maybe in your area you have uh, an incumbent or something that's just awful, you know, look for something like that, or there's open seats in Florida, there's term limits on everything in Florida. So like every four, every two years, there's somebody leaving office where you live. So the uh, current city councilor is leaving office uh, this year, um, but then you have state representatives, state senators and all that. So it's, it's those kind of things add up. Um, but yeah, it's, let me just get down to it is, yeah, it's intimidating and it's a lot of work. Um, but it is rewarding work if you like to organize your community and, uh, you know, it's, it's gotta be, I think, and I think we've been making this message the whole time. It's gotta be part of a bigger program. It's can't just be about getting you elected because, um, if it is, then, you know, you're gonna, you're not gonna be able to motivate people the same kind of way. You're not to help you as, in a volunteer capacity. You're not going to be able to, um, you know, uh, actually change things because getting one person elected doesn't. So I guess in that's more of like a, a broad sense, but in a more practical sense, like um, to get connected to, you know, people with knowledge, look, we're all lucky because we're in DSA. And uh, like was said before, um, we're hopefully going to be able to mentor people. I mean, uh, my campaign's done as best as we can to share knowledge with other DSA campaigns, uh, particularly, you know, in places uh, that haven't had a ton of success, maybe a little, but like, I mean, we're not sharing information with New York. If anything, I'm asking people in New York and Chicago to help me, but like, you know, we've got a little bit of experience here. And so uh, we've talked to people in Atlanta and Cincinnati and stuff. Um, and, you know, if you can get connected with any of those people, they'd be glad to talk to you. Like people in DSA are always happy to share information with other people in DSA. Email the email address and, you know, maybe we're busy and we miss it or something, but send it to like multiple uh, candidates that are running or multiple DSA elected officials and uh, the NEC until somebody gets back to you and uh, they can give you practical advice. Um, you know, there will be a local progressive organization in most of the places around you. Um, but if it doesn't exist, you might have to build it. Uh, but I can tell you right now, what you're up against is not some all knowing people. It's not people who uh, even make good strategic decisions. Most of the time, it's mostly just people with a bunch of money. And if you organize and you and you get people uh, excited about your campaign, you can raise a bunch of money too, um, with just a little bit of help. And I think DSA can offer you that little bit of help. Uh, if you just reach out. And so uh, I'll leave it there because I think, you know, we should lean on the organization that we're all a part of. And, and I think that's the important message to take away. Thank you so much, Richie. I myself am feeling the pull towards running for office. I hope the people in the audience are as well. Thank you so much to our three speakers, Fanon, Robin, and Richie. If you'd like to support Richie's campaign, you can do so. I posted a link in the chat. Um, just a reminder that this call was put on by the National Political Education Committee and DSA's National Electoral Committee. Uh, you can find both of those by going on to DSA's website. And if you need help in your chapter with either an electoral campaign or political education, you should reach out to those groups. If you're not a member yet, of DSA, you haven't decided to join during the call, even though it's been so informative and exciting, you should help to build the largest democratic socialist organization in the country by going to dsausa.org slash join. And otherwise, I hope you all have a good Tuesday evening and thank you for joining us. Thanks everyone. Thanks, good night. Hi, thank you all for all the great questions. Bye-bye. See you later.